All righty. Welcome anyone who is joining us. We are also live on Facebook. So for those of you who are on Facebook, welcome. Happy to have you here. We will be starting in just a moment. All righty. Okay. And I get a thumbs up from you, Roland. Do you see the right slides? Awesome. All righty. Okay, cool. Um, welcome anyone who's on Facebook and welcome any of you who are in the uh, webinar room for Zoom. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the Southern uh, Hemisphere BioBlitz, um, and we will go ahead and get started um, with some introductions. So if you've been here before, hi, <laughs> I'm Emma. Um, I am a program coordinator for SciStarter. If you have any questions about anything, I'm happy to answer them. And then Roland, would you introduce yourself? Thank you. I'm Roland, also a site starter, and uh, I'll be posting all the links which you might need related to this webinar. Awesome. Yeah, any technical support you might need as well, you can send that to Roland um, just in case uh, if you're in the Zoom or even on uh, the Facebook as well, if you'd like, and he can help you out. Right. Um, OK, so. Uh, so today, as usual, just to set the set the stage for what you have available to you um, in the chat. Um, you have the ability to use the chat um, and therefore uh, go ahead and send us messages in there if you need to. The Q&A is specific to questions about how to um, get involved in the project, get involved in citizen science. So anything you want us to address for everyone who's listening either now or later in the recording, um, the Q&A is a great place for that as well. Um, if you are here, uh, we would love to test your ability to use the chat. So go ahead and send a message in there if you're with us. I'm going to go ahead and send a message. For example, I am Emma zooming in from Phoenix, Arizona. Phoenix, AZ. Hi, Bob. <laughs> Bob's in Maryland. Trevor, welcome in Ohio. Awesome. Roland from Lebanon, <laughs> I assume. Nothing's changed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Amazing. Welcome from Washington. Cool. Okay. Are we talking DC or are we talking the state? Surely. <laughs> I guess we'll never know. Oh, the state. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, awesome. Okay, well, welcome. I'm happy to have everyone here. All righty. So um, before we move on, I just want to preface. Uh, so today's kind of a unique situation because our guest uh, lives in Australia. And so if uh, she were to be involved, um, live with us, like very, very live. Um, it would be like 3 a.m. or something for her. I don't recall what exact time, but it's in the middle of the night. So we figured it might be best um, if we went ahead and interviewed her separately. And so we did. Uh, Roland met with our guest, Michelle Neal, um, over the weekend to get a firm understanding of what's happening with these Southern BioBlitz. Um, and so here's some background about uh, Michelle. So Michelle is an analytical chemist uh, of the Queensland government. She is also uh, previously the secretary and now the current social social media curator and moderator of the Australian Citizen Science Association. Um, she is a volunteer scientist, CSIRO STEM professionals in schools for the, um, the STEM professionals in schools. She is also a scout leader um, from the Kapal uh, Kapalava Scout Group. I'm not positive on pronunciation. Um, also a baritone saxophone player, which is crazy and super cool. Awesome, Michelle. Uh, and a project leader of Space Scurvy, which you might recognize the name of, as I mentioned it in previous uh, webinars, um, and Bright Sparks Citizen Science Projects, um, and a Citizen Science Practitioner for the Great Southern BioBlitz. So that is, that last one is what we'll be talking about today. Anything else that you'd like added there, Roland, since you got the chance to speak with Michelle? No? That's, that's about it. Now we'll learn more about her in the video, which we're going to update. It's awesome. So, so involved with so many things. Um, anyway, okay, so I uh, would like to know where you are all from and also so that we can get some uh, a gauge on on uh, what you have experienced with already. So have you ever participated in citizen science, uh, in a citizen science project before? I'm looking for 100% participation if possible. 
Be great. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so, so far, 100% of you who answered said yes. So in that case, that's very uh, helpful to us. So we can kind of glance over some things. If you've been to a SciStar Live event before, we'd like to know that as well. Awesome. Okay, cool. We have a split. So for those of you who have not joined us before, welcome. Uh, we're happy to have you here. If you have, which was a couple of you as well. Um, awesome. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, we will continue um, as normal. We do want to know what type of person you are so we can kind of have an idea of who uh, is involved in these types of webinars so we can help curate it to you. Are we asp aspiring citizen scientists, a student? Parents of aspiring citizen scientists, teacher, educator, troop leader, et cetera, librarian, library staff, researcher, project leader, et cetera, waiting another moment, board person on the internet. That would have been me about two years ago. <laughs> awesome. Okay, cool. Students and aspiring citizen scientists, welcome. Okay, great. Um, this is a great, actually, uh, if you are a part of the um, aspiring citizen scientists or students, this is a great one to get started um, your involvement in um, iNaturalist as well. So I'm excited for you. Alrighty, so citizen science, we sort of know because most of us have participated in citizen science projects. So just briefly, our official definition is a collaboration uh, between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. So if something is impacting your life and you want to make a change about it, citizen science is a way for you to get involved uh, and make an actual impact um, and help real science, right? So the step one to get involved uh, is to actually join SciStar.org because we are essentially a database of, um, or a citizen science hub slash database with more than 1600 projects for you to choose from. There's something for everyone. You can look up a specific word and find all kinds of things that relate. I think I looked up Penguin once and found 15 different projects. So there are clearly enough projects to go around. Um, in addition to joining SciStar.org as an account holder, uh, we have trainings for you. I've talked about this in previous times, so I'll kind of glance over this, but just so you're aware of uh, moving forward beyond the foundations, we also have another four that you can be involved in. We did talk about the data literacy in one of our previous live events. You can go and check that one out on our YouTube playlist for SciStarter events. Um, that one is especially helpful if you're looking to feel a lot more confident in whether or not you're giving um, uh, good data and quality data to projects, because that is important, right? Alrighty, so today we're going to talk about the Great Southern BioBlitz of 2022. Um, the Great Southern BioBlitz actually happened between the 28th and 31st of October. Uh, so it was a short period of time that has already happened, right? We're already in November. So why on earth are we talking about it now? Uh, the identification project part of it is going to be discussed in the interview. Um, but just to give you a good look at what that exactly means is that we're looking at observations that have already been taken. So observations have been taken, they're still being uploaded. Um, and we're going to see how we can be a part of the help. If you're not in um, the Southern Hemisphere, your observations don't actually work for this project, but your input on helping us identify these different animals and uh, plants, animal, all kinds of life, is really important to making sure that we have quality, quality data and we can get a good picture of what's actually present um, in the Southern Hemisphere bioblitz. So before we move forward, I do want to just get a gauge. Before I had talked about any of that stuff, have you heard of the Great Southern Bioblitz before? Had this been a question? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Got about 75%. Okay, good. Okay, so most of you have not. That's good. Okay, so you're going to get a great understanding of what this is. Um, if you are in the Southern Hemisphere, you can go ahead and drop that in the chat because that would be super helpful to know if you are uh, possibly a part of this entire uh, temperature check of the environment. Um, and then separately, uh, does anyone here already use iNaturalist? I would hit yes for this one. Um, I'd be allowed to, I'm not sure. Nope. <laughs> awesome. Okay, a bit split. All right, so 67% of you are yeses and 33% of you are noes. Um, awesome. Okay, so this will give you a good idea as to how the, um, the iNaturalist project works and how to get more involved and get credit for your observations when the time comes. All right, I'm going to go ahead and pause here. That is not an error. error. Instead, it's just because I'm going to send us to a different page. Um, awesome. So we're going to go ahead and watch this interview with um, our lovely Michelle and Roland's um, 
guide. So I'm gonna go ahead and switch to share screen so you can hear it all. Um, sharing sound, going to a video. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and mute so that you can hear all of this, but let's go ahead and take a listen. Happening during these couple of weeks. Uh, hi, Michelle, and thank you for being on SciStarter Live. Uh, can you tell us more about yourself and your role in citizen science in general and in this event particularly? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Oh, I should say good day. Uh, my name is Michelle Neal. I'm from the Great Southern Bioblitz and Ferox Australis. I'm also the uh, former secretary and currently the uh, curator and moderator of the Australian Citizen Science Association's um, platforms as well, social media platforms. I'm an analytical chemist by trade. I'm also uh, Joey and Cub Leader as well here in Australia for Scouts. And Joey's are five to seven year olds and Cubs are eight to 11 year olds. Occasionally I jump in with the Scouts as well and they're 11 to 15 year olds. Um, I do a lot of citizen science in my own backyard. I do a lot of citizen science um, for fun. I'm going out to a bio blitz actually this coming weekend, <laughs> would you believe? But until then, I'd love to talk to you about the Great Southern Bio Blitz. Um, would you like me to share my slides now, Roland? Yes, yes, please. Emma? Yep, okay. So a little bit about the Great Southern Bio Blitz. So the Great Southern Bio Blitz is not really a traditional citizen science project, as you probably understand it. We don't really have scientific outcomes per se. Instead, we're acting aiming to increase awareness in the use of iNaturalist, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere. We're building a network of citizen scientists around the globe. We're increasing biodiversity awareness and scientific literacy. And we're also wanting people just to find out what's in their own backyard. So iNaturalist actually has a lot of um, nodes as such. We have one here in Australia. There's another one in New Zealand. Uh, Peru has one. They're all around the world. In iNaturalist, you record your observation. You share it with your fellow naturalists online, either via the website or via the app. And then you can discuss your findings, although it's easy to discuss them online. All those research grade then um, ones then go into the GBIF, the Global Information uh, Biodiversity Information Facility. And we can then actually look, use them to find out what species are near us. Now we do actually then can then publish data from that too, and anyone can publish that data. Uh, GBFI Natural Data Set has 2,490 dissertations at GBFI.org so far. There are more coming. We include species discovery, extension of range, morphology, and more. Uh, when you're asking on Facebook and Instagram, what is this? It doesn't actually mean anything unless it's actually posted to something like iNaturalist where it can actually then be uploaded into the biodiversity databases. If you can also post from iNaturalist, it will also give you location data as well. There's lots of citizen science projects here in Australia using iNaturalist, such as mozzie monitors, sea slugs, wild pollinator counts, uh, environmental recovery project, wild orchid watch, and heaps more. But the GSB, or Great Southern Bioblitz, actually came from a whole group of us, about eight of us originally. And what that was, was we were doing the City Nature Challenge here in Australia, but this global event, event during spring was in the Northern Hemisphere in spring, whereas in Australia, that's actually autumn. Everything's heading north for the, for the winter, not south, north, because that's what happens down here. We wanted to really explore, as Australian organisers, wanted to explore areas of unexplored biodiversity. So not just the cities, but look, Australia is a really big place. It's a, roughly the same size as the continental USA. Uh, Queensland, where I live, is twice the size of Texas, for example. I believe in the US there's about, I think, 300 million or more people. Australia has all this land and there's only 25 million of us. So there's a lot of area to explore. But you can see some of our original organizers there on the left. But we also decided that, you know, maybe it just didn't need to be just Australia. What if everyone, what if we invited some of the other organizers from around the world to join us too? So we did. So we did. Now that first year in 2020, of course, we had um, COVID hit. 
So we had to go from it's a go anywhere, explore anywhere to, oh no, we're just going to explore our own backyard and our own local area, depending on what you can do in your area. So we had some people out, as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, um, and I think that was Cuba or Columbia, Columbia, I think, who decided to get a group together and go out into nature and, and find things for themselves. We had little people, uh, other people just doing it all on their own nature trails, top left. And we had others bird watching from their from their daily walks. So in the first GSV from 2020, and we we recognise that this is only in the southern hemisphere, there was 91,359 observations in 12 countries in 157 areas. Look, honestly, we thought we were going to get 30 areas, maybe 40 if we were lucky. 157 was well above what we expected. If you have a look at the observations on our naturalist little graph here in Australia in 2020 compared to 2021, 2020 is that is the um, sorry 20 that's supposed to be 2020 compared to 20, 2019. You can see the first blip here in end of April, beginning of May. That was City Nature Challenge. And then you can see the larger blip at the end there, which is which is the first Great Southern Violets. So we did lots of different fun stuff. We have, when we asked for people from all around the world, we had no idea of the sort of things that we'd get. So zebras in Africa to monkeys up trees in South America to all sorts of weird, wild and wonderful animals all over the world. In 2021, we, we actually moved the Great Southern Bioblitz Bi back a month. So instead of being in end of September, we moved it more to the end of October. Because what we realized was that there's a whole heap of areas in the Southern Hemisphere that still have snow at the end of September, which, you know, being from a subtropical area, I didn't realize. But that was the feedback we got. So we took that on board and we said, okay, no problems. We will move it back a month. So again on the graph here, you can see this is the 2021 compared to the 2020 compared to 2021, not 2022. Um, the first blip here is of course the City Nature Challenge from 2020. The second bit blip here, a little bit larger, is City Nature Challenge from 2021. Now uh, I will mention that in Australia, the City Nature Challenge, when it falls at the end of April, actually falls on a national long weekend and most people aren't home. We go away so it's a little bit hard to get people in cities to to do biodiversity counts later on in the year as you see we have the the first little blip here just before october that one there was from the year before so that was that larger blip we saw in the last year then you can see the next blip which doubles in size for the next year and literally we doubled the amount of observations so 192,000 plus observations this time from 18 countries in 245 areas. So as you can see, it's, it's grown. And again, we got some really amazing, weird, wild and wonderfuls from all over the world. I'll let you take all that in, different frogs, all sorts of stuff. This year, um, we've just finished the, the timing for this, or it's just about to finish. When you when you we're looking at this now, so what happens now? The southern hemisphere has finished taking the observations just this last weekend. The next step for us is for everyone to upload those observations, and for everyone else in the world, please, hopefully, to help us by identifying those observations. Now you don't have to be an expert to do this. You just have to know the difference between, say, a kangaroo and a koala, or a bird and a bat or maybe even something as simple as a spider versus an ant. But we have a lot of people that are helping us out and we like to give a huge shout out to people like Redland City Council, the Entomological Society of Victoria, Wild Orchid Watch, Sea Slug Census Sunday, Atlas of Living Australia, Geelong Field Naturalist Club, and many, many more. Now, as we're worldwide, we also have our logo in different languages. So on the bottom left, you see that we have the Great Southern Bit Bioblitz in English. And then we also have our Spanish and Portuguese versions as well. We don't as yet have Maori, but that's coming. 
and we don't as yet have Afrikaans, but that's also coming. And have a look for those other two next year. A big thanks to Larissa um, who helped prepare the graphics. And a thank you very much for joining me today. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, we mentioned uh, iNaturalist several times, uh, but when someone wants to contribute on this platform, can, you, can they do it from a mobile app or from the web or both? If you're uploading an observation and you're in the Southern Hemisphere, they can be, or in the Northern Hemisphere for that matter, under normal circumstances, but if you want to contribute to this, uh, you can, any, any photos you've taken of wild species can be uploaded, that you've taken between 28th and 31st of October, you need to upload usually via the app or via the, the online portal on the web, website. Okay. However, if you're not in the Southern Hemisphere and you still want to contribute, we have this secondary project called the Identification Project. And that's where we ask everyone to jump on our naturalist and jump on the Great Southern Bioblitz um, Umbrella Project for 2022 and help us identify all of these um, wonderful and weird creatures that we have in the Southern Hemisphere. Okay, okay. Yes, I, wa I was going to ask. Oh, hang on, you're breaking up. Hello. About uh, your two projects on Site Starter, about the difference for this uh, webinar, participants will be able to go through the identification project, right? Yes, that's correct. So uh, participants can sign up via the identification project, which is an affiliate in um, Site Starter. And until when? Until, until when? <laughs> so we ask that all the IDs are done by the end of November. Okay. Okay. Because we start crunching and numbers on the first of December. Yeah, yeah. And they have until fourteenth of November to submit their photos if they have ones already. And I yes. suppose that in case they didn't take the photo from the iNaturalist app, uh, they should have the GPS settings enabled in their camera app because you need the, the geolocation information to know yeah. uh, what species has been found where. Right. Yes. So it has to be GPS located and time and date. They're the two things we need plus the photo or photos, depending on yeah. what phone you're on is how it depends on how many photos you can upload. So I think there's, I tried to do it on my iPad and there was, I could only upload four at a time. Uh, whereas on my Android phone, I think I can do 10. So it just depends. It does depend on what device you're on to. And what's the advantage? Is it for taking photos from different angles to help with identification? Ideally, yes. So something that people don't understand always is that sometimes it's different parts of the, of the item that is actually needed for identification. The I, tail. Um, yeah. So sometimes you may need only the flower and the stem or something like that. Sometimes you need, for example, with a mushroom, you need the gills underneath the mushroom. So it may not have enough photos in there or enough identifying features to be um, research grade, but we're trying our darndest to get it as far as we can. Okay. Uh, I just want to ask you about this uh, tree behind you on the background. What about it? Anything special? Is it Australian? Uh, this is the jacaranda tree and it's our feature species for 2022. So every year, the Great Southern Bioblitz has a feature species that's something that's local to Southern Hemisphere. In this case, if you take a photo in Australia of a jacaranda tree, chances are it's a street tree. It's actually been planted, not wild. But it will actually come up with um, the IUCN message on iNaturalist that it's an endangered or vulnerable species. Yeah. And that's because in its home range in South America, it's actually considered endangered and vulnerable. Whereas here in Australia, we planted as street trees. So it's something very iconic that every person in the Southern Hemisphere will, will go, oh, that's a jacaranda. Um, every person will know in the Southern Hemisphere what that tree is. And it's immediately iconic. Okay. So, and, so. and for those who don't know uh, what a bioblitz means, 
can you tell us more uh, about uh, the meaning of this word? Yes, yeah, so bioblitz is a basically an intensive um, time frame. So between one day and the next, okay. or two hours, or in this case, four four days of intense biological surveying. So you're looking at every single creature, flora, fauna, fungi, or fungi, depending if you're CIC or you're CN, um, yeah. um, and even those things are below the water as well. So fish, turtles, other things as well, frogs, um, that is in that area at a given time and a given duration. And it's interesting how these terms are becoming not interchangeable, but how, for example, for example, we always knew that there there is fauna, which is for animals, including insects and fish, and flora for the plants and trees and so on. But now uh, a new term has been coined, which is the funga, which is uh, for fungi. Uh, so uh, uh, there's been attempts to split between classifying flora and uh, fungi. Uh, are they technically considered plants or uh... I, I don't know on that one I, I'm okay. not I'm an analytical chemist if yeah. you want to know what pH <laughs> of it is I can tell you what pH is but that one I leave to the biologists and the the plant specialists and the botanists in, in, in the group okay. um, for me I'm interested in mostly getting people out there and having a look or online and helping us ID um, I've been taking our cub pack and our scouts out and our joeys out this last couple last last weekend. Uh, we've found some amazing things out there. Um, who knew there was eucalyptus beetles? We didn't. Now we know there's something new. The joeys and the cubs love finding out new things. Uh, we did a moth night last night and uh, waiting to see what some of those were. But there's not just okay. moths that come out at night. There's is here in the Southern Hemisphere. There's also night flying butterflies as well. So you never know what you're going to find. You really don't. Wow. But have a look at uh, some of the sea slugs too, because they're amazing colours too. So there'll be all sorts of stuff on there because we've got the Great Barrier Reef in there as well. So, you know, you can take a virtual trip to the Great Barrier Reef and have a look at what people have found up there. You can come down here to where I am in Southeast Queensland and you can have a virtual look at the, at the, uh, the kangaroos and the koalas. You can go to and there's always, Africa. And in these BioBliss events, there's always the chance to discover new species. No one knows. Yes. Always. New species, species previously thought as not part of uh, this ecosystem. Yes. And we are finding here in Australia that things are moving further south or up mountains the more it heats up too so it is a good good way of, of looking at range extensions as well um, and we don't really have anything in Australia that looks at that on land we have a project here in Australia called red map which looks at it in the water but it doesn't look at it on land so yeah it's it's an interesting to see how how much range extension we get on things like brush turkeys and toads and like introduced species like cane toads um and where we find other introduced species and feral species like deer and camels and you know all sorts of things okay and uh, if a participant uh, wants to uh, to identify an observation which another participant another volunteer previously took and uploaded what if they don't know the species name? What can they do in this case? Well, as I said, you don't have to be an expert. However, if you can tell the difference between a koala and a kangaroo, by all means, just put in that it's a koala or a kangaroo. If you know it's definitely an animal and not a plant, put it in that it's an animal, not a plant. Okay. So okay. it's really, we're asking whatever you can do is a help because we have specialists in different fields that, you know, we have plant specialists, we have animal specialists, we have Australian specialists versus New Zealand specialists. We have all of this stuff, but they need somewhere to start. They need to know, you know, if they're a plant specialist, what are the plants I need to look at? So ideally, and eventually an expert uh, should be, should be checking the observations just to make sure uh, that they are accurate and correct. 
And we generally have those in each LGA. So Great Southern Bible, it's set up a little differently to City Nature Challenge. So City Nature Challenge is very city orientated, whereas here in the Southern Hemisphere, we're more local government authority orientated. So an LGA is a local government authority. So think of your uh, shire or your county or your um, city even, but that's an LGA. So we have LGAs that cover, you know, quarter of the size of Texas. So yeah. we'll have someone in there or someone nearby that will say, okay, we'll give you a hand with that because it's a lot of area to cover. But we do have not a lot of people in a very big area here in, in Australia for starters. So it can be a little challenging and that's why we're asking for help. Yes. And as a reminder, anyone with internet connection and a smart device can identify uh, species, not just from the Southern hemisphere. Yep. Uh, it, it's, it's easier to do it on the, on the, um, on the iNaturalist.org page. It's, it's easy to do it on the web and I can show you a quick little thing and then you guys might want to have a go as yeah. well if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me see if I can share my screen again. Oh, no. Let me just make sure I've got the right thing open. There we go. Mm -hmm. So if we go into, this is how it's currently sitting at the moment when we're doing this, but there will be more coming in. As you see, we had 70,000. Now we've got 72. It's still growing every day. It's growing, but in here we can go to uh, a grid. So this is actually the Great Southern Bioblitz umbrella project. Okay which has, we have that listed in our project on site starter, that, that address. So if you didn't catch it, that's fine. We go into grid. Okay. And we can actually go through and identify from here. You can also identify using this identification button up the top as well. So we can go through just something like this, which says unknown. So even if you're just looking for any unknown things, and that's been submitted from down here in South Africa. And I can go into that and just say, I don't know what it is, but I can call it. Plant and it'll say, okay, it's the kingdom of plants. And I can say done. And then that actually says, okay, it's a plant to our naturalist. And it puts it back into now a plant one up here. So if I go out of here and back into the observations and I redo that, when someone else agrees with me that it's a plant, that will be changed to a plant. Okay, so again, we can go into unknown ones and just say, okay, let's have a look at this. What is it? I'm going to say it's a plant again. Even something as simple as this. Helps. Can narrow yeah. down the possibilities. Sorry? Uh, something like this can narrow down the possibilities. Yep. And so that one was actually in, I believe, Nairobi? Nairobi? Yes, Nairobi. So yeah, we've got a lot of stuff coming in from all over the world. I can put this now to Australia. So far here in Australia is 29,900 and 39 observations as we do this. Um, I'm betting everyone will be all of a sudden putting everything on now. <laughs> everyone else that's is going almost, That's almost huge. half of the total is 72,000. That's almost half the total. Yeah. We do know that many people in Australia and overseas as well don't always have access to the internet, which is why we give them to the 14th of November to upload because they might have a whole heap of them and they just don't have access to the internet until they get home or something like that. So this one here, superb fairy wren, for example, I know that is a superb fairy wren and I know that was taken in South Australia because they're endemic to that species and I know Philip quite well. So I can go onto this and I can agree that that is definitely a superb fairy wren. Okay. okay. And isn't that cute? Yeah. <laughs> With the white hat. So the white hat is the differentiating factor. 
the white hat. Sorry, it's blue. Uh, the, the white hat, the white fur on the head. It's actually Is blue. That... I don't know if you can see that through there, but yes, that's the yeah. differentiation. Yeah. So they're really tiny little birds. And during spring, they break out in these amazing colors here in Australia. And they have all different colors, but the, that blue and black coloration um, is typical of them at this time of year. But normally they're all covered. So this one's, I think, probably going through its molting stage at the moment and about to turn into a beautiful uh, fairy wren. Okay. But yeah, so you can go to anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere and have a look just by changing the location. Uh, let's go to, say, New Zealand. So there's 3,000 observations from New Zealand so far. At least that I can see. And all these geese and swans and sentinel crabs. From the same user so far. From the same user so far. Maybe but yeah, from the same location. Probably the same location as well, but there'll probably be other users. So we've got up here, we can say, there's 408 observers and you can actually see yeah. who's who does what where which is a really cool little feature of of here but yeah we can go through and, and actually do some more if i go through identify little tab at the top here i can search say australia and then i can filter it by you know an exact date range if i start it say friday and only do say till sunday say and i can say update search and then once it flicks over it'll tell me you know what's an unknown what's not so i can go into something like this like a, a mushroom and say it's a fungus Great. So yeah, there's lots of different ways to do it. <laughs> and maybe among the most important things is to keep running the same event annually, because that's how you, you're able to, to compare uh, the species uh, decline or, uh, or to know if the species is, uh, is healthy. Yes. By yes. doing it all, all over again. Yeah, so that's that's the idea. So this is only in its third year and we're building momentum as we go. So next year we're hoping more people, even even if you're thinking about coming for a holiday, why don't you go to the uh, Southern Hemisphere somewhere for Great Southern Bioblitz? Um, do something worthwhile with your holiday. Have a citizen science holiday. It's very popular actually here in Australia to do a citizen science science. holiday. Yeah, yeah. So Great Barrier Reef is currently doing citizen science here as well. Um, a lot of places in Australia have citizen science projects. We have over 400 that we know of and our project finder and has shared or has been shared with SciStarter as well. So by all means, come and come and try. <laughs> and it, it does seem like Australians have a good sense of volunteering because 29,000 observations across a few days in citizen science. Uh, is that right? And uh, do many Australians know about citizen science? Uh, any numbers or in specific locations? We tend to be, it, it's a growing thing. It really exploded during COVID because um, people were sitting at home with nothing to do and wanted something interesting to do with their time. It really was um, like it's been around in Australia since the probably 1800s, 1900s, easy. Oh. Um, but it hasn't always been called citizen science. Yeah. So sometimes it's just been you've been helping out a scientist by going out and collecting plants for them or something like that. And here we'll give you the here's here's the the permits, go to this place and collect this for me. So yeah, lots of different things like that has happened over the years. Um, but the Australian Citizen Science Association didn't really come into being until 2014 here in Brisbane, which is just down the road from me. Um, in Southeast Queensland. Um, and then after that, we formed the Australian Citizen Science Association here in Australia. We had our first ever conference in 2015, literally 18 months, not even 18 months after we formed uh, in our 
Australia's capital, Canberra. Planning to uh, repeat it again? Sorry? Planning to, to do the conference again soon? We had our second ever one in 2018 in uh, Adelaide. And we're looking forward to our next one at the end of next year. And we will be announcing that one hopefully before the end of the year. Okay, interesting. Just dotting I's and crossing T's and getting signatures on everything first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what generally happens here in Australia is we, the Australian Citizen Science Association understands that we want as many citizens as, as scientists to come along. Because that's when the real synergies and the real conference type stuff happen. And fun as well. Don't forget the fun. Um, we try and make our conferences as fun and interactive as possible. And as such, we generally ask for whoever we have the conference at the venue, we ask for a free venue. And this helps us keep the conference costs down. So our conference in 20, 2015, I think was around about 200 or $300 to attend. Our conference oh. in 2018, I think was about 380 from memory. Our first conference, we had about 200 people. Our second conference, we had 400 people. Our third conference, we're expecting 800. Well, wow. that number so, is growing. The number is and, growing. And probably from Australia and from our world. world. Yes, mostly from Australia. Yeah, so that 95% of that would have been Australian. Um, we do have, we do usually do um, bursaries for students from overseas and we try and help them with accommodation and so forth when they're here as well. So. We, we understand that coming to Australia is a big trip. It's a long trip for most people. I mean, I went to the 2019 CSI conference over, uh, sorry, CSA conference over in, um, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And that was a 26 hour flight in the end. Oh, yeah. And it was two, it was two flights to get there and three flights to get home. So, but at yeah, least participants yeah. can classify online observations from they Australia. They absolutely can. They absolutely can. So that's, yeah, that's that's AXA's conference. This is Great Southern Violets. It is technically two different things. Yeah. And it is related. Yeah. So yeah. that was a really interesting presentation. And thank you again for being with us. Uh, if you'd like to share any thoughts, but uh, thank you. Thank you again. No problems. Did anyone have any questions? If anyone have, has questions, we will send them to you and reply back to them. Definitely. Awesome, because it's just gone about 2 a.m. in the morning here. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, sorry for keeping you that long. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to head off to bed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, sorry everyone, my Zoom decided to disappear on me. I couldn't unmute myself. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Okay, I feel like I just got transported to a different country for a nice little look of, um, a nice look at the other side of the world. That was great. I'm jealous that you got to have that conversation with Michelle. So um, I'm glad that we had that. Um, there were quite a few things mentioned in there and a great tutorial on how to use iNaturalist, not only for observations, but also as um, someone who's identifying different species. And again, you don't have to be an expert. You can go in and actually just support projects um, based on your um, basic understanding of wildlife. Knowing a difference between a koala and a kangaroo is significant, even though um, it seems like not that big of a uh, big of a deal in the moment. So just know that that is very useful to everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again to my presentation um, because as um, as a member of iNaturalist, if this was a good intro to iNaturalist, as it was for me, I learned a lot about things that I didn't know you could do on iNaturalist um, just from viewing that. Um, you can also get uh, get uh, credit and contribution counts uh, for your work on iNaturalist, specifically with putting posts on. However, in the future, we do want to track uh, when you make observations, or sorry, when you make identifications on observations already in existence. So just be aware that that is um, in the works and we're looking forward to that in the future. Um, excellent. Okay, 
So uh, in order to do that affiliation, it's a little bit different. So in case you're looking to do that from your uh, SciStarter account, which you all should, um, if you're on SciStarter.org slash dashboard, you'll have a little menu here off to the left um, that gives you an option for info and settings. When you click on info and settings, you'll actually scroll down to affiliation integration. And iNaturalist and Zooniverse are pretty unique in that we have a really easy way to track contributions with them. And so just by putting your username, not even using the same email address necessarily, it's just the same um, username, it'll track uh, your contributions there. So uh, that's what I have there. My EC Giles is written there to make sure that it can connects. I noticed that um, Michelle's username was dragon bat dragon something and I just when I saw that I was like this is amazing I love this okay um so you can use any username uh to show off your awesome um skills with uh <laughs> with identifying wildlife I suppose um and just by doing that we'll be able to track your contributions and you'll be able to see um how often you contribute and then hopefully in the future we'll be able to see how often you identify too so that'll be um really useful moving forward all righty now beyond that I just wanted to give you a brief update if you take a look at the bottom left-hand corner here, 144,380 observations, the observations we saw in that video have basically doubled. It is incredible to see. So I'm glad you got to see that amount versus what is the now. Um, that interview reminded me, Rome, is that on Saturday? On Sunday. So these are in, in less than two days. Yeah, yeah that's incredible. Less than 48 hours. That is absolutely incredible. I'm glad that um, you all got to see that timestamp versus now. Um, I pulled these numbers right before just so we could get the most accurate data to the now. Um, and that is just insanity. I'm super excited for that project. Uh, now, we did have a few dates mentioned on there that I want to make sure are available to you. So November 14th, um, all observations. If you are in the Southern Hemisphere and you took any observations, um, during the end, uh, the end of October, or in the last couple, or like in the last couple of days in general, um, if you upload those up to the project, they should be counted within the Southern BioBlitz, um, and you can do that up through the 14th. So, um, as mentioned before, this is this is a project dedicated to making sure we're as inclusive as possible, in addition to just taking that temperature check of the Southern Hemisphere, and so we want to make sure that regardless of what opportunities. Um, that individuals have as far as uh, internet access goes, you can still submit up to two weeks later, which is a really important thing and a big deal in my mind. So I'm glad that they're um, they're incorporating that aspect. Um, November 30th, the last day of November, is the last day to help observe uh, or identify, excuse me, identify observations. And just as a reminder, anyone can do this. I'll be doing this later um, this week uh, to just go online and see what I can identify as a random person and be able to say, oh yeah, that's a part of funga, uh, or if it's fauna or flora and make sure that I know, oh, that's definitely a plant. And then someone else down the line can start narrowing it down. So I'm glad we got to see that, uh, that description of how, um, as how we can get more specific. Um, and that is super helpful. So I'm gonna pause here. We just listened to a lot of information and I have a lot of thoughts about it and questions myself about, um, about iNaturalist. Um, does anyone have a question about this at this point? Do we have any questions? It's okay if we don't. I have questions I can verbalize myself. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, as a reminder as well, there was a conversation about um, uh, planted or uh, human planted plants versus the ones that happen in nature um, because of the the picture of the the tree that was behind um behind uh, michelle so i just want to make sure that everyone knows uh, within iNaturalist uh, when and if you start using it it allows you to choose if it is cultivated or not uh, native in your observation and so as you become an observer over time uh, being able to say oh yeah this is cultivated as in it was in someone's garden someone put it here um, a human interaction happened uh, that bit is actually trackable and that really helps us understand the ecosystem of an environment and how it's being changed as well um, so if you know it's native or you know it's cultivated being able to say one or the other is very important um yeah okay so good Okay, that was the big the big thing I wanted to make sure that we could clarify 
um, for anyone. Um, and know that just by participating in iNaturalist, you could end up being the one to discover a uh, new species or hasn't been uh, seen in a long time species. I was just reviewing um, a story about a, a ferret. I think it was a ferret, or it, it was referred to as uh, the toilet weasel because it was not identified for years. It hadn't been seen in years until 2018 when someone took a picture and put it on iNaturalist of a weasel that was sitting inside their home on a toilet. So you never know what your random discoveries will find um, or your random posts will find on iNaturalist. It's super helpful. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. If there aren't any questions, know that you can go back and listen to that video and look at the areas in which she, uh, Michelle talk, uh, talks through how to do the observations. I know I'll be going back to check to make sure I'm using the right tools because a lot of that in there was um, Michelle's just very much an expert at iNaturalist at this point. And so using her tips on how to go through and observe and identify uh, different things is, is really, really helpful. So um, know that you can go back to that. This will be posted on our YouTube channel, the um, uh, SciStarter events. All right. And I guess we'll start closing out if there aren't any specific questions. If there is anything, you can always ask SciStarter via our email at info at SciStarter.org. Um, if you need assistance with specific projects, um, you can ask the project leaders by sending a message within SciStarter, uh, the project page per each project. You can also ask the community. We have an ability to write in messages to each other uh, to ask for advice or to check in with each other on these projects. And you are 100% um, able to use that and we want you to. Uh, we also have trainings available to you as mentioned at the beginning. And if you ever are looking for a new project, you can use our project finder. Um, one of our new objects we added in here is a note to our podcast. Um, our podcast is available pretty much everywhere. Um, so it's always a good thing to check in on. And one of our next up uh, SciStarter Live events will have our podcast host on with us to um, say hello and also host with us. So that'll be really fun, um, fun experience with uh, Bob, Bob Hershon. Awesome. Who I think is here today right now. So hi. <laughs> oh, I see some things in the chat. Let me double check. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those things, Roland. Awesome. Okay. Oh, just a note also for the Southern BioBlitz, that umbrella project has a list of a ton of different projects of independent ones that were hosted within um, the Southern BioBlitz. So just be aware that if you, when you uh, are looking at different ones, you'll be seeing like different environments, uh, different projects are made for different geological locations. If anyone was thinking, what is an umbrella project? <laughs> um, that is why that is there. Awesome. Okay. And just as a reminder, next uh, next week, we of course have another one of the SciStar Live events on the Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and next week, we'll be talking about the uh, fungi quest, uh, the outcomes of a giant uh, fungi quest, which was similar to iNaturalist, the Southern BioBlitz, um, was specific to funga. Um, so we'll have a fun time talking through those things. There is a post event survey that we would love for you to fill out. Uh, Roland just posted it into the chat. It takes very little time. It just helps us know where we're heading um, and how we can keep moving forward, keeping you all in mind. Um, so if you're listening to the recording or you're listening um, live, you can um, take that uh, survey for us uh, to help us out. But otherwise, we'll give you about five minutes uh, back of your uh, of your time. And since we're ending a teeny bit early, um, but thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions, we are absolutely happy to help um, and happy to stick around to answer those if there are anything. But otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your afternoon or evening, wherever you are, or morning. Thank you, everyone. Saying goodbye to Facebook. Thank you for joining us if you're on Facebook. And bye. And I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording. Bye, everyone.